So this is my annual Green Radio project update, nominally kind of our State of the Union. Uh, so anyone who's seen this before, at least for the last three years, is used to me yelling at all of you for waiting until the very last minute to book your tickets. So I made this chart uh, about uh, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, and you can see it was just below 300 then. I was looking at this, I was like, this isn't so bad. I mean, it, it, it isn't, it's not like the flat thing and then the exponential spike, right, that we usually see uh, where I'm worried about the solvency of the conference and that kind of thing. Uh, but in the last, like, week, that has spiked to way up above 350. I just didn't have time to make a new chart because all of you registered so late. <laughs> so, I might just give up at this point and accept that like, we somehow have to forward pay for GRCon before getting money from any of you. But thank you all for being here. So I'm going to kick this right off with the big news. 3.8 is finally out. Uh, so, yeah. So huge thanks to the core development community. Uh, Marcus Mueller and Andre and Martin and everyone uh, that serves in an officer position of the project worked extremely hard over the last year to make this happen. Uh, you might have noticed that the 3.8 release announcement came out extremely early in the morning, German time. I realize there's more than one time zone in Germany, I apologize. Uh, but yeah, uh, this was a lot of work. So there were more than 200 contributors in the change log for 3.8. And we went and thought, okay, what, what does that mean? How, how many projects, not just have 200 contributors, but have 200 active contributors? Uh, and there's not many. There's not many. Uh, we, GNU Radio is very legitimately up at the top in terms of community engagement and participation and the type of people and the breadth of people that are participating. Um, it is also good that we did this uh, since Python 2.7 is no longer supported in less than three months now, I think. Uh, <laughs> and our 3.8 release was the Python 3 migration. So we kind of got by by the skin of our teeth there. So one of the things that was interesting about releasing 3.8 is the news got picked up in a lot of places that we'd never heard of before. Here's a few examples. Uh, this website packet had a whole thing on it. Oh, now, lwn.net, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but they had a big piece on it. Uh, we hit the front page of Hacker News. I don't really care for that website at all, but it was interesting to see a Gunner Radio release announcement be on the front page of Hacker News with a whole bunch of people commenting on it. Uh, we made several print magazines. So this is a picture from Derek of the Radio Society of Great Britain's magazine where they sort of copy and pasted chunks of the change log in ways that don't make any sense. <laughs> into the magazine, it, they, they did it in a way that it's like not all that great. It, it like, it's the first sentence is like, it's their first release in six years, and the next sentence is a bunch of code stuff. Uh, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it made us look all that good, but we got a lot of attention for this. It was really cool. Um, one of the things that we've gotten the most comments on, that yes, it finally has squiggly lines. James, are you in the audience? No? Of course the examples just worked, James. Did you expect something different? Uh, so one major note here is the, your out-of-tree modules probably have to be ported. So if you are an out-of-tree maintainer, please get your stuff ported. Uh, Bastian Blossel actually wrote an excellent guide for how to do this that works really well. Uh, it's not a huge challenge. Most of the problems are really the Python 2.7, the Python 3 assuming your blocks are written in Python. Uh, but the porting guide is pretty, pretty straightforward. So this is my yearly stats slide. Uh, participation is way, way up. Uh, you can see the numbers for CLAs, issues, and pull requests. Now this is kind of, uh, this isn't a full view, right? Because a lot of the community doesn't, act, a lot of the community does not interact with Gunner Radio through GitHub. And so most of these numbers are through GitHub. Um, but enough of the community interacts with it that kind of gives you some idea of the overall growth, right? So you can see we're at 1,100 
here when I pulled this chart, 1,100 unique cloners per two week period, um, just from GitHub alone. That's up by several hundred from last year. Uh, our executed CLAs are up 155%. We're up almost 60% in year-over-year -year closed issues. And pull requests went from 272 to 443. So participation is accelerating. We once again participated in Summer of Code programs. So we actually did not participate in um, the ESA's Summer of Code program this year, but Daniel Estevez did and had a student work uh, with Gun Radio, and actually he has a poster here, and Daniel has a, has a keynote later this week. Um, our two Summer of Code projects were a block header parsing tool, which will auto-parse your, uh, your block source code header and produce a GRC YAML file. Uh, and then, Bound, who, who should be here? Are you in the audience? Hey, I'm so glad you made it. Uh, Bound had a very long way to travel to get here. Uh, he created a cycle accurate simulation of Verilog files from GRC. So if you have a Verilog file, you can drop it in using his code and actually get Verilog simulation from within your flow graph. Uh, they both have posters in the expo. Um, Bowen's here to present his. And uh, if you have questions about ARPIT's work, you can talk to uh, Nicholas. And I want to give a really big thanks to Felix for once again running GSOC. Uh, it is a lot of work. Uh, in terms of managing the overall program, working with Google, managing the movement of funds. It's, a, it's, it's not an insignificant task. So thank you very much, Felix. So technically we ran this last year. Uh, the reason I'm going to talk about it now is we want to do another one shortly. So uh, last year we released several SIGMF recordings containing some hidden messages uh, and just kind of threw them out in the community and wanted to see how much interest there was. And it turns out there was a lot of interest. Um, we got participation from all over the world. Our winners were from the US, France, Hungary, Slovakia, and the Netherlands. Uh, the challenges themselves were built with RDS and some simulated NOAA downlinks. Uh, but this was really exciting and people got really, really into it. So we we're planning to do another one of these. Uh, and the goal is to have it, uh, have a breadth of challenge levels. Um, so ones that are you know, doable and solvable by uh, people who are perhaps new, and some that are really difficult. Uh, so keep an eye out for this. We should have an announcement somewhat soon about this. One of the big things we did this year was uh, the SETI Institute sponsored and hosted a hackathon at the Allen Telescope Array in Hack Creek, California. Uh, this was prob We've had a lot of hackathons over the years. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. So we had 30 attendee, th over 30 attendees from industry, government, academia, and hobbyists. And it, uh, it attracted a lot of people who otherwise had, had not participated in the community. Um, so the key areas of development there were SIGMF, Gun Radio Blocks for actually working with and on the Allen Telescope Array, which uh, Mike Piscopo did. Uh, Mike's here and he is running the uh, SDR for Space Signals workshop tomorrow. Uh, Gun Radio for Radio Astronomy. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, antenna array monitoring and health from GUNI Radio, and machine learning for signals detection and classification. So one of the really cool things that came out of this, uh, there was a lot, but one of them that I want to highlight now, uh, Nick Foster produced flow graphs for actually processing signals from Voyager. Uh, so the SETI Institute has been publishing SIGMF recordings from the Allen Telescope Array and Green Bank. And so you can go download those and then use Nick Foster's flow graphs to play with Voyager signals from Green Radio. Uh, and these slides will go live, so if you don't want to like try to type those the URLs real quickly, you can click, click the links. And I had to include this picture because it really was beautiful there. Uh, it, it was phenomenal. Uh, so I'm going to go through just a couple other things that generally happen that people might not be aware of. Um, so there is a conference uh, hosted by uh, Enzo Leon in the EU every year called EU Gun Radio Days. This was its second year, and it more than doubled in size. So this is pretty quickly becoming sort of the, an EU, EU version of GRCon. Um, this year it was in, I, no chance I'm going to pronounce that correctly, Besancon, France. Uh, they have already announced for next year uh, in, again, I'm not going to know how to pronounce this, Poitiers. Somebody help me. <laughs> France. Uh, so it is always in June. Uh, this year, Marcus Mueller keynoted. We had a bunch of other people fly in from the Gun Radio leadership. 
it's, uh, you might notice, you might recognize some of the sponsor names here, uh, especially Analog Devices and Roden Schwartz. Uh, they have really, really interesting content and they have a lot of participation from the EU academic community. Um, so I recommend making the trip if you can do it. There's also the SDR Academy. So this was its fifth year. Uh, it's organized by uh, one professor in, from Germany and one professor from the UK. And you can see one of their, right, their top, their top requested topics are advances in Gen Radio related research and projects. So uh, this is another, this is a one day event. So it can be, if you're based in the US, it can be hard to make the trip out for a one day event. But uh, if you're looking for an excuse to go to Germany, uh, this, this particular event is specifically geared to be like a learning experience, right? It's called an academy specifically because it's supposed to be an educational experience. So this kind of leads me to what I'm going to spend most of my time here talking about, which is the Gun Radio community itself. Um, and so every year, you know, I, I kind of spend like 10 minutes of this talk sort of highlighting major things that have happened around the Gun Radio community uh, that some of you may or may not have heard about. Uh, one of the things I, I think I really want to try to get across this year is just the incredible breadth of everything that's happening in and around Gun Radio all the time, all the time. Uh, and so I, I use the word community a lot. Um, it's kind of ambiguous, right? Is community the developer community? Is it the people who come to GRCon? Is it the community on the mailing list, right? Uh, in reality, the community that most of us know is a tiny microcosm of everything that's happening in Gun Radio. Our best guess is the mailing list is somewhere less than 5% of users. GRCon is way less than 1%. Um, there are things happening constantly. So what I've done is uh, I have gone back over the year and tried to pull a lot of really neat things that I saw on Twitter, just on Twitter, uh, about things that are happening. So uh, just one example, there are classes that are taught all the time uh, and events happening all the time that people from Gun Radio attend or even teach. So on the left is an image from a Gun Radio tutorial workshop taught by Derek in Belgium. On the right is a picture of the Chaos Communications Camp in Germany, which was just a couple weeks ago. Uh, Gun Radio was hosted by Stratum Zero. This is, uh, so NSF is running a program called Power, where they're building city scale test beds. Like literally, it's a, there are collaborations between universities and the city, and the university goes out and deploys SDR test beds over the city, like putting them on buildings, uh, and making a test bed that people can use for scientific research. Uh, Powder is one of them. It's in Salt Lake City, so it's a collaboration between Salt Lake and the University of Utah. Uh, using hardware from Rice University, they built the Powder test bed. Um, they're running good radio tutorials in Salt Lake City. Pretty constantly, actually. Uh, these are really cool tweets from Case Passa. So uh, Case works at the Institute for Astronomy in the Netherlands, uh, and he volunteers at the Dwinglu. Dwinglu? Dwinglu was. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Was that Paul? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> at the Dwinglu Telescope. So Paul is who uh, actually a major part of that is giving a talk on Thursday about this work. Um, but, and Daniel Estevez is also a major part of this. Uh, but I'm gonna highlight these tweets from, uh, uh, from Case just because they're so cool. So you might have heard that of the DSLW, the DSLWPB, which was the lunar orbiter that uh, NASA flew into the, sur crashed into the surface of the moon, right? He observed that from the telescope, and you can see here on the left the Gun Radio flow graph running, and sort of live tweeted this happening. Uh, as, he was, as he was making these observations off the telescope and then as the orbiter crashed into the moon. Uh, and you can see on the right where uh, he determined that it had in fact crashed and there was a crater on the moon. This happened again uh, just a few weeks ago uh, with the Indian Vikram lander where he was live tweeting and tracking uh, the Vikram lander as it attempted to land on the moon and unfortunately crashed. You can see on the right here uh, where things kind of go awry. And he, I think he was actually, I looked elsewhere for someone to have determined that the Vikram lander had crashed before this, and I, I couldn't find it. 
I, I, I think this was the first sort of like public evidence that the Vikram lander had failed to land. Uh, so I found this one. Uh, so this, is a, this was a, a Chinese satellite that took off. And I have no idea, by the way, I have no idea who most people in these, in these tweets are. Uh, <laughs> uh, I found this one. Uh, he, demodul he basically reverse engineered and demodulated uh, this satellite downlink using Gregor flow graphs and posted all the flow graphs and the data recorded from them, um, just for fun. Sentinel -Rs continues to be amazing. Uh, so we had a Sentinox keynote last year, which was awesome. And now they have all kinds of neat stuff happening in their community, like people building these uh, touchscreen stations to run their Satnogs ground stations, uh, which is, of course, you know, uh, using good radio behind the hood. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is Alan, Alexandru, who wrote GQRX, uh, who toured the ESA's CubeSat ground station during the CubeSat workshop. And uh, the ESA asked, perhaps some of you know this software, which was the software that Alexandru had wrote. Uh, so we got a picture of him sitting next to the ground station running uh, GPredict and GQRX. So phase four ground continues to move quickly. Uh, you might have, uh, if you were here last year, you would have seen a presentation from uh, Michelle Thompson about that, who's one of the GRCon organizers, and she ran the, the block party last year for building block decoders. Uh, and there's a lot of work happening around here for satellite downlink decoding, especially from Ron Economos, uh, who his, his uh, working name is Dr. MPEG. So all of the DVB stuff, DVB anything, uh, that exists in the open source world has probably come from Ron. Uh, so DVB-T, uh, T2, S2, S2X, he's written all of those decoders. Uh, and he continues to push that forward. Uh, as part of the phase four effort. Um, now, what's really cool about this kind of thing is, like once you're sort of tuned into this, you start seeing it pop up everywhere. So as an example, I saw this Wired headline um, about, this is, Defcon, this is a DEF CON talk this year, um, watching a drone take over a smart TV. The idea here is uh, smart TVs, well, the hack that was being shown was that smart TVs have absolutely no authentication and do not care at all uh, where signals come from, and so he stuck a Raspberry Pi on a drone and flew it over somebody's house, and the smart t a, sm a prompt on the smart TV came up and said, please give me your Wi-Fi password, I need to reconnect to the network, and it looks totally legitimate. Um, and as I was watching the YouTube video, uh, he kind of pans right to the laptop, and you can see him running the DVB, Ron's DVB utils for this work. So the, the stuff is everywhere. Uh, and there's, there's a clear, very clearly a space theme to these, by the way. Just because we're here, uh, there's a lot more that's not space themed. So these are interesting. So on the left is uh, somebody who's tweeting about having built their CubeSat ground station with a HackRF. Uh, so this is not just receive, this is transmit and receive. Uh, on the right, so I actually edited this slide this morning to add the one on the right. This tweet went out uh, last night about uh, this person took GR LilacSat and modified it and are now decoding Taurus-1 telemetry, um, which I think is a Chinese satellite that's now somehow part of AMSAT in some way. I don't, I don't actually know what Taurus-1 is. I tried to look it up and got confused. So there's now a Librespace has produced a SATCOM channel simulator, which is really cool. So this was a joint, um, uh, joint initiative from uh, ESA and Librespace that came out of Makerspace. And uh, so you can fully simulate uh, SATCOM channels from Gun Radio now. I thought these were really, really neat. So on the left, I actually, for, I, I'm not really sure what that thing on the left is. Um, I, it's clearly some tiny little ARM-based board, I'm assuming. Uh, but they got GQRX running on it with an RTL. On the right is a Nintendo Switch. Uh, so this one's kind of cool. This is actually, it's an RTL dongle that's running somewhere else and streaming samples to the switch over Wi-Fi, and then they have GQRX running on the switch. Which is really, I, I, I have no idea who this person, are, are, Spectrophagus, are you in the audience? No? So whoever they are, they tweet really cool stuff pretty regularly with Green Radio, having a clue 
where they are or who they are. Um, but this was really neat. He said that the next thing he wanted to do was, uh, the thing that he started working on was trying to get Phosphor running on the switch, accelerated by the graphics card. Uh, this is some cybersecurity stuff, right? On the left is Holly Graceful, uh, basically doing some playback attacks uh, for fun. Uh, on the right, so there's actually pretty regularly, um, and I'll go into this a little bit more later, there's pretty regularly courses given and tutorials written about using GNU Radio for cybersecurity. Um, we almost never hear from the people doing this, which is, <laughs> which is interesting, but uh, that has especially exploded in the last two years, uh, especially with the, the success of the HackRF um, from Great Scott Gadgets and the explosion of the RTL dongle. Uh, it's made RF way more accessible to the cybersecurity community, which perhaps didn't previously have the radio background to have been successful with it. Um, and I have some more slides about that in a minute. One thing I do want to kind of highlight here, uh, so GRJSM hit the news again. So everybody is familiar with GRJSM. Uh, it's been around since about 2014. Uh, and on the left, is, so there was a, uh, an article written by Vice uh, where the Vice uh, journalist made an MC catcher with GRGSM in 30 minutes and wrote an article about it. And so that then, of course, exploded uh, and it got captured on the right by Cory Doctorow, uh, his blog, uh, Boing Boing, and that spread really quickly. Um, which is kind of interesting because I think actually we haven't, we haven't really worked with GRGSM, GRGSM in a little while. Uh, but it's kind of an indicator of how the Garino community tends to tends to push things forward really quickly, often before sort of everyone else that might be interested in it realizes what's happening. And then we see this effect where like five years later, people are like, oh my gosh, like this happened. And it hits the news and spreads everywhere. This was kind of like, uh, right, two years ago when the Daily Mail published an article about stealing cars with HackRF, right? We, we see this pretty commonly. Uh, again, cybersecurity courses, uh, there's, GNU radio-based cybersecurity courses that get taught at tons of cyber at tons of conferences. I just grabbed these as quick examples. This one's from B-Sides. The one on the right is from Black Hat. Uh, the one on the bottom is actually an online course that was written by Bastion. There's actually several textbook series now that have been released uh, that teach cybersecurity with GNU radio. Um, the person who wrote those in the audience? Well, I don't know who they are. Uh, I really like this one. So this is Dominic's. Dominic builds ridiculous radios. They got featured on Hackaday. So he builds SDRs out of random parts. The one on the right is built out of parts from a VCR uh, that interfaces. And you can see it, uh, it's, you probably, I don't know if it's too washed out. You can see uh, radio flow graphs running in that image there. So we also continue to see an expansion in education and curriculum development. So this one, this happens, again, this kind of thing happens all the time and I feel like I only, we only see like bits and pieces of it. So uh, Dan Jacob, I'm not actually sure how Dan spotted this. Um, Stuttgart tweeted that they were phasing in radio into some of their courses and Dan caught it. Uh, and so I reached out to the professor and it turns out they're making Gunner radio the core of their uh, signal processing, radio, wireless communications curriculum at the undergrad and graduate levels and rolling out an entire curriculum for it starting next year. Um, and this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, it's just that, you know, the, professor who, the professors who have done this are not here. Um, and we don't necessarily hear from them. So what I'm really trying to communicate is uh, this community, to again sort of overuse the term, is huge. And there's, there's just constant motion and constant development. Uh, and I think we only really see a very small part of that. And I think it speaks to the strength of what we built. So real quickly, uh, to go through some expansions and growth in hardware support. Um, so SignalHound announced Radio Blocks last year, which was really cool. Uh, RTL SDR is made, basically chained four, four RTL dongles together and called it the Kerberos SDR and has made that it's specifically geared for direction finding. Uh, ADI is working through the grep process to upstream GRIIO into GNU Radio, which uses the Linux kernel's industrial I.O. module for data movement. 
Um, if you want to get involved in this rep because you care about data movement on embedded devices, go do it. Uh, we're really, really excited about this. Uh, there's Kiwi SDR, which is a low-cost uh, low cost SDR built specifically for geolocation. Uh, DeepWave's GR Wave Learner, which is built specifically to facilitate uh, performing inference or machine learning uh, within Green Radio Flow Graphs. This is one I just saw this morning, actually. Uh, Hermes Light 2, which has been designed to be a low-cost HF design. It actually uses the 809866, which is a, a cable modem from ADI as the codec. Um, but it's that, that particular part is produced in such quantities that this is going to be extremely cheap. Uh, so I wanna, I'm highlighting this one, the Tuja, Tuha, I'm not actually sure how they pronounce it, SDR, because Alvin Stego is one of the developers of this board. So this is uh, an FPGA-based SDR that's being built to be a Raspberry Pi accessory board. Um, I'm gonna talk about Volk in a second, but there's been tremendous movement in Volk recently, and a lot of that is happening because of this SDR. So with that, let's talk about Volk and SigMF. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Volk, Volk is the vector optimized, vector optimized library of kernels. Um, it is our way of doing SIMD, single instruction multiple data uh, operations to accelerate flow graphs. Um, and then SIGMF is, and I have a talk on this later, but SIGMF is a way to create data recordings and then share them and process them. Um, so Volk has seen a lot of development in the last six months, especially on ARM devices and especially on the Raspberry Pi. So if you have not tried running Good Radio on the Raspberry Pi recently, and that's something you care about, you should give it a shot. Um, Albin has been on a roll and has been committing kernels and making improvements on an almost weekly basis. Um, we're very lucky to have Albin participating. He's actually an anesthesiologist in Sweden uh, that just does this for fun. And the guy is pumping out SIMD optimized kernels at a rate that's incredible. Like, I don't know how it's not his full-time job. It's amazing. Uh, so SIGMF has also expanded significantly in the last year. Uh, one of the interesting things that we've seen about SIGMF's expansion is that it's mostly silent. Uh, most of the people that are using SIGMF don't actually like tell us that they're doing it. And I sort of just pick up these bits and pieces of things or like somebody will send me like a, a, a statement of work um, piece from like a company or a government or something like that and it is demanding that everything be delivered in SIGMF. Um, so SIGMF is sort of like silently taking over the sharing of RF data. Um, so we spent a full week uh, at the SETI, SETI Hackfest working on the SIGMF design, a core group of us did. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot more about SIGMF when I talk on Wednesday. Um, but not everyone is going to be there because my talk is after lunch, so there's going to be the workshop split. So the one thing I want to make clear to everybody, uh, if you're not going to make it be, the, be in the talk, is that uh, it's become clear that the current design of SIGMF is really good at what it does, but that it can do a lot more if we make some non-backwards compatible changes. And the direction we're going to take it specifically is to try to answer the question, how can you record data and describe it and such, such that another program, another computer, can understand those descriptions without a human ever being involved. Um, and we've made really good progress on this, but it's gonna break backwards compatibility. So going forward, uh, we're gonna take the existing SIGMF structure, clean it up, close the remaining issues, basically put that into maintenance mode, bug fixes only. And from there, the new development branch will break backwards compatibility. But this is the direction we're going. Uh, and we have good momentum to get there. So I couldn't talk about SIGMF and not talk about, so knowing that I was gonna build this presentation with mostly tweets, I uh, tweeted last week and said, you know, if there's any, if you have a favorite Gun Radio tweet, send it to me now, I might include it. Um, the one that I got back a lot was actually mine, uh, but not perhaps in the way you might think. So. Uh, I thought I was being clever. Uh, we just got, my uh, deep save, we just moved to a, a very uh, a high rise in Arlington that overlooks DC. Um, so I thought I was being all clever and taking pictures of uh, my B200 
you know, connected to this antenna overlooking DC. Probably can't see it. That's the Washington Monument. This is Georgetown, right? These are pictures on the right. This is a picture of Arlington. So, you know, the antenna pointed back over um, like Roslyn and Boston and Courthouse in those areas. Uh, this is so cool, right? Um, and then I got dunked on harder than I've ever been dunked on in my life. <laughs> when UC Berkeley tweeted their collaboration of teles radio telescopes. <laughs> and then to make it worse, this was NVIDIA's response. <laughs> Thank you, NVIDIA. So on that note, I'll talk a little bit about SETI. Um, we're really excited to announce that SETI is co-sponsoring, specifically the SETI Institute is co-sponsoring GRCon 20. So uh, you might remember SETI, the SETI Institute delivered a keynote last year. Uh, our collaboration with them has grown substantially in the last year. Uh, there is a lot of overlap in our joint goals and the things that we value and the things that we want to achieve, both in terms of technology direction and education. Uh, and we're really excited about the way this is developing. So just to answer a few questions about, wait, I thought SETI was just aliens. Um, SETI has, is actually a much larger program. What most people are familiar with is SETI RF. That's the thing on the right, right? Which is detecting aliens with the giant array that you know, we had the hackathon at, that, you, that the movie Cosmos was about, right? Not Cosmos, sorry, um, Contact. Contact, confusing my Carl Sagan writings. Um, they have a lot of stuff uh, in many, many different areas. And it's a, it's a pretty significant research institution uh, they're partners on a bunch of NASA missions. Uh, they have a significant sort of worldwide network of telescopes um, that we can get access to. Um, now, all of the telescopes, the Allen Telescope Array is the only array that is allowed to track human-made objects. Um, all the other arrays can be used to track anything else. Um, and they have a really interesting mix of funding sources and partners some of whom you might recognize from the green radio community, others uh, are new. So we're really excited about the direction this is going uh, and are looking forward to working with them on GRCon 20. And Steve, uh, Steve Croft, are you here, Steve? No? No? Oh, sorry, Croft, not Conklin. <laughs> sorry, Dr. Steve Croft will be here. Uh, he's actually giving a talk tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little, about that, little bit about GRCon. Um, First, I want to give a huge thanks to the GRCon 19 team, uh, especially Michelle and Steve and Derek. So if you could just get a round of applause for them. Um, so it's, uh, it is hard to communicate how much effort it takes to make this thing work. Even with all the stuff that's gone wrong, like you don't have power strips, right, and registration took too long. It, it, it's taken thousands of hours, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of hours to make this happen, and we do it every year. And this is all volunteer time, right? Um, so Michelle and Steve and Derek have, uh, Michelle and Steve co-chaired it, and Derek has poured tons of time into this, have really made this possible. Um, and there's a lot of other people that contributed, uh, Neil Pandea of Edis Research, Sam of MITRE, uh, Kathagata, who is a professor at UAH, there's a lot of students here. Um, he was involved early with the idea of coming to Huntsville. Uh, there's a lot that goes into making this thing work. Uh, and none of these people are paid to do it, and they spend the entire year working on it. So, GRCon 2020. We are almost definitely headed to Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I say almost definitely, because we have not actually executed the venue contract that we have, uh, but we're probably going to Charlotte. And until we have a venue, can't guarantee dates, but for the last like five years, we've been this week of September, so probably this week of September. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, please reach out. Um, you, you don't have to spend thousands of hours, right? Every little bit helps. So if you think you just have a couple hours every other week, right, even that helps. Um, so if you'd like to get involved, please just shoot us an email, grconicradio.org. So what I want to use the remainder of my time to talk about is project direction. So uh, each year I've kind of had a theme, right, or like a question posed. In 2017, 
the question I asked was, how we hit P1DB? Um, right, it was, Gario was at that point, uh, what, 16 years old. Uh, it had expanded significantly. Uh, and the question was, okay, what, what do we do from here? Uh, have we hit P1DB and is growth gonna start to sort of level off? Uh, or in my belief was, if we double down on this, this is gonna explode into something even bigger. Um, so I think that very definitively the answer was nope, we didn't. We definitely did not hit P1DB. If anything, things have accelerated. Uh, and now we see our, our understanding of Gunner Radio has evolved, right? We used to think of it as Gunner Radio is the project, uh, like it includes like Volk and SigmaFet, everything that we all think of as Gunner Radio, right? But it's really so much more than that. It's an, it's an umbrella of lots of different work. It's a collaboration of universities and industry and business. Uh, most of whom we never hear from, right? Uh, it's much broader. Uh, that I, th that I think we're coming to understand uh, just how strong and how large the footprint is. So in 2018, I asked, how do we address sustainability? Um, so since last year, a lot of really good things have happened here. Um, the thing that I was most worried about last year was effectively financial support for people to work full-time on Good Radio. Uh, we've had several good conversations that came out of this, and things are actually looking really good. Uh, we have sponsors that have stepped forward to help fund Good Radio R&D, and we have things in the pipeline now for actual revenue-generating programs. Um, there's work to be done on a more stable organizational solution, uh, but things are really, really good here. I'm not worried about this. So, What's my question for this year? I think it's time that we start looking at the Gunner Radio runtime. Uh, so Gunner Radio is 18 years old. So it's almost two decades. I want to say that the fact that a scheduler that was written in 2001 has made it through two decades of SDR work is incredible. That's a feat of computer science. Um, but I think it's time for us to start talking about what comes next. Uh, things are changed. Things have changed a lot, right? In 2001, everyone thought Moore's Law was still, right, still the thing, right? That's what you would think about was Moore's Law, right? I think everyone knows now that Moore's Law is dead. Um, so, in the leadership community, we've been talking about this as Gen Radio 4.0. So, and so that's that's not meant to be a joke, right? We're at Gen Radio 3.8, planning for 4.0, where that would be a new runtime release. So it's clear now that moving forward, the future is heterogeneous, it's parallel, and machine learning is gonna play a huge role. Uh, and there's also just the fields of computer science and software engineering have advanced significantly in the last 20 years. Everything like developer experience and uh, dependency management, uh, how you deal with uh, you know, client server designs in the cloud and the local, local nodes, uh, how you can instrument and debug complex systems. Uh, the world has come a long way. And I think it's time for us to circle back around and think about, okay, how do we make a good radio scheduler that's gonna last us the next 20 years? So we're not under any illusions. This is gonna be a very substantial undertaking. It's gonna take years of effort from a strong team. And this week, uh, one of the things that we really wanna be discussing is the organization and planning of this. So I, I think we're at the point of asking the question, what do we need to know? Like, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we know all of the things we don't know yet. Um, so that's what we're trying to figure out. Is what do we need to know uh, in order to figure out how to do this? So if you have thoughts about this, if you care deeply about this, if you have been thinking about this, um, come, you know, just come talk to me. Come talk to any, anybody that's active. Uh, we want to figure out how to do this right. Realistically, this is going to be two to three years of work and we want to make sure the thing that we produce is going to last us another 20 years. So I'm going to end this just with a few, um, uh, a few other bits. So one of the things we're talking about is the idea of offering SDR office hours. So this would be good radio developers effectively offering mentoring or one-on-one -on -one office hours for people who are either new to SDR or no SDR and are new to contributing to open source. Uh, so we're running a survey to gauge interest and gather feedback. Um, this got a bunch of press actually about a month ago. 
uh, and there's been a lot of responses. But I don't actually know that it got a lot of attention from sort of the community that comes here. So I want to highlight this. Um, that URL is an L after the two. That's two L S E U R Z. Uh, if you're interested in being a mentee, uh, or you know somebody who might want to be a mentee, or you're interested in being a mentor, please fill this out. Um, just to be clear, we don't know that we're going to do this. It represents a significant time investment, uh, but I think it's a way to expand the community, help educate people that want to get involved but perhaps don't know where to get started, because let's be honest, SDR can be really hard. The last thing I want to say is I'm giving an open source licensing talk tomorrow. Um, I want, uh, so I've made this survey. It is a five question survey. I suspect it's going to be very easy for some of you, uh, but perhaps very difficult in ways you didn't anticipate. Um, it should only take a couple minutes, and what I want to do is show the results of this sort of questionnaire at the start of the talk. Uh, and the goal is to just try to gauge how well do we actually understand the way open source licenses work. Uh, so this again is an L. It's 2L WTGXK. So please fill it out. And I'll, show, I'll share the results at the beginning of my talk. So with that, are there any questions? Do we have a good sense of how many people understand the runtime right now? And if it's really small, do you think a good step might be to focus on broadening that knowledge base? Yeah. <laughs> how many people understand the runtime? Uh, so there are probably a half a dozen that really, really deeply understand it. And I'd say probably a dozen more that uh, understand how it works, but perhaps not why it was designed the way it was. Um, so all together, you know, I'd put it somewhere between 15 and 20 of people who could really contribute to that conversation. That's more than I thought. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, so for example, the, the keynote that Marcus Mueller gave uh, at EU Gun Radio Days this year was on the runtime internals and how it was designed and works. Um, so we, I, I think we have, I, I agree, it's, it's, I, it's actually, I did not think we had as many people either. I sort of sat down and went through it. Um, it's actually pretty sizable. Yeah. What's up? Dan? Sorry. We're supposed to have two floater mics. Uh, waiting for the venue to give us a second. Thanks. Is there a big release between 3.8 and the the uh, scheduler change? We have not specifically planned for that, but we're talking about the scheduler change as 4.0 to allow for that release um, prior to swapping out the scheduler. And I, I, I should say, right, one of, the, one of the most difficult parts of the conversation about changing the runtime is, so we have, we have 20 years of application code, right, that's immensely valuable, right? I mean, that, that's really where the value, if you're gonna think, talk about the value of the code, that's really where the value is is in all of the modules that have been written around Green Radio, right? Um, plus, the scheduler does work. It just works, right? So we have to find the balance between uh, the incredible value of everything that we have and not being, I think, constrained by the design concepts of 20 years ago. Um, where that balance is, I'm not sure. Like that, I think that's what we're trying to figure out is, uh, how, how much do we want to maintain and value what we have now versus breaking it for something better? How good does better have to be in order to do that? I don't know. I mean, maybe the answer is we don't. We maintain backwards compatibility for absolutely everything, and we have translation layers, right? I don't know. What's up, Marcus? So uh, I do happen to have a talk about exactly what the plans are on this mm -hmm. for tomorrow, so yeah, come and see me. All right. So I didn't do my slides, so this is good input. <laughs> Other questions? No? Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, so.